Hi, this is Mr. Collier, and this is the first of a couple of videos in which we're going to talk about plant diversity. And so in this first video, we'll talk about the ancestor of plants, the green algal ancestor, and then we'll also talk about bryophytes, which is one of the first groups of plants, or the first plants to invade land. So let's get started. Plants evolved from freshwater algae, and so we find freshwater on land. And so natural selection would have favored those plants that were also able to live on land. And so one of the reasons it's advantageous to live on land is that there's a greater amount of sunlight. And so this allows the plant to be more productive. Uh, underwater, uh, even at shallow depths, light is diffused. And so by <clears throat> being able to live on land, it allows them to increase the amount of sunlight that they're able to receive. Also, carbon dioxide gas is going to exist in lower concentrations in water than we'll find in the atmosphere. And so by living on land, they're able to take advantage of this higher concentration of carbon dioxide gas, which of course is used for photosynthesis. In order to live on land, it's necessary that plants be able to, to have some protection from what's called desiccation, or essentially drying out. And so those most success, successful plants are those that are able to, um, that have adaptations that protect it from uh, throughout the life cycle. Living on land also means that it's no longer surrounded by water, and so it has to be able to transport water. And so some of the earliest plants have very rudimentary or simple systems for doing so, and the more evolved plants are going to have a complex vascular system to transport the water from the ground up to the other portions of the plant. And so these plants can grow tall and therefore take advantage of increased increased collection of sunlight. We know that the ancestor of plants or the uh, predecessor to uh, current land plants probably existed sometime around 500 million years ago. And so some of the evidence that we have for this is that both uh, charophytes contain, um, as well as land plants, contain chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Uh, they also have a cell wall made of cellulose, and then they're going to store excess carbohydrates in the form of starch. And so these things are common to both plants and charophytes. And so charophytes can be divided into two groups, these seen here, the chiralis and the coleocate. And so chiralis is in order, so it consists of several um, families of, of charophytes, and <clears throat> the coleocate is a genus that exists, um, consists of about 15 um, I believe different um, species of of charophytes, and so while the ancestor of this plant, these plants no longer exist. If it did, it would have features similar similar to these that we find in this these uh, members of the charophytes. Here you can see in this diagram uh, the how the evolution of plants has occurred, and so uh, here is our <clears throat> um, here's our green algae ancestor. Right, and then um, you can also see that as it evolved, that we have some evolutionary features. Um, the one that is common to all land plants is going to be this embryo protection. So that's essentially what distinguishes it from or one of the things that distinguishes it from the charophytes. So these charophytes again are going to be uh, green algae, whereas the rest of these are what we scientifically refer to as land plants. Some of the features that would have benefited or things that would have promoted the evolution of a land plant is the cellulose cell wall. Another thing is apical cells. And so what we mean by apical cells is that they are able to increase in length. And so we see this in some of the charophytes. Um, and then, of course, we see it in the apical growth of current land plants. Another uh, evolutionary advantage or, or feature that would have promoted this evolution is that what is called the plasmodes mata, which is a um, essentially like a pathway or a way for the cell cells to communicate to one another. And so they can essentially transfer nutrients. And so that nutrient transfer is also something that we find in the placenta. And so this is kind of like an animal nursing their young, where this nutrition is passed from one generation to the next. All land plants show what is called an alternation of generations. And what that means is that there are two alternating forms in the life cycle. And so those two forms are what are called the sporophyte, 
which is also a two um, also referred to as the two in generation, and then the gametophyte, which is referred to as the uh, the in generation. What has happened over the evolution of plants is that we've, because the sporophyte is the only one that develops vascular tissue, uh, over time what we've seen is an increase in the, the dominant generation or the conspicuous, meaning that what we see has increased in size. So you can see here the moss on the left hand side to what uh, would be like a fruit tree here today, very large um, sporophyte. And the, the gametophyte has been reduced to uh, microscope, almost microscopic size in some cases. <clears throat> this group of plants protects the embryo and so that protection of embryo is lends to the name uh, the embryophyta and so that <clears throat> it not only prevents it from drying out but also provides this provides it with a uh, provides it with a food source in the case of a seed so it's going to increase the likelihood that it'll survive on land. The sporophyte is going to produce sp several sporangia, and so these sporangia um, are going to produce spores, which will then become the gametophyte. And so the gametophyte is so named because it is going to produce the gametes. Other, some other derived traits that we're going to see in land plants include the cuticle, which is this waxy, impervious coating that we find on the on the uh, surface of the, the plant and leaves and so this keeps it from drying out uh, and so this is very important um, in order to conserve water. It also prevents gas from from being easily transfused and so plants have evolved what is called a stomata and so the stomata is an opening that we find in the leaves and so this opening uh, while it loses some water it's able to control it and so that it does allow the gas to uh, carbon dioxide to come in and the oxygen to to go out and so these stomata are found in many land plants also also what we see in many land plants is what is called apical tissue and so this allows for some complex features so for example in this diet in this illustration we can see how um, from this node we have developed uh, branch, uh, leaves, and flowers. And so this develops from the apical tissue. Bryophytes are going to be the first group of plants that colonize the land. And so they only have superficial leaves, roots, and stems. And so it's not true vascular tissue. In fact, we refer to these plants as being non-vascular. And so <clears throat> some examples are uh, liverworts. And liverworts have what is called a rhizoid. And so the word literally means um, like little roots and so they're not roots but rather hair-like extensions that hold the plant to the soil and, and then do provide some limited absorption of water. The hornworts also is one of the members of the bryophytes and so they are so named because of these uh, these horn-like extensions that is the sporophyte. Okay? And so see in this picture we can see both the gametophyte and the sporophyte. The largest group of non-vascular plants is going to be the mosses. And so this group, along with the other bryophytes, um, are extremely important ecologically. Uh, they, uh, because they have limited transport of water with the absence of uh, vascular tissue, they tend to grow in places where, it's, where there is uh, high humidity or it's uh, cool and damp. So, well, that concludes plant diversity, our first video, and so I hope you learned something.